Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a great way to start the recording to make that noise know, right? at the very beginning. Like, that's a good like you uh, get action used noise. To it. He doesn't oh, I, I've I've it's known like Peter for part. years and years and years. I'm very used to it. So welcome, <laughs> welcome YouTube. This is my roast uh, that we're recording <laughs> here today. Uh, but yeah, all right. You so... forgot the where. Where? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. There you go. I know what people like. All right, let's just open up the discussion and we'll see how this goes. So I'll, I'll try and there's quite a lot of different things to get through, so we'll try and keep it to be relatively short on each thing. But Bilgewater is the big one, so I guess just just open the field there. You know, we've got the information there about the in the spreadsheet about you know what what it does, what the units are, and things. What's people's first impression of Bilgewater? Having now played it a bit, what kind of stuff might you bring up on cast? Oh. Uh... I can start, I guess. Yeah, please. So, uh, um, actually, we already have like storylines for this trade because it basically ruined the whole launch. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I think uh, you, you can say some people already have PTSD. It's gonna be um, interesting to see how how they will um, how it will be like next patch going into the GST because they will probably buff it uh, again a bit. But the interesting thing about this uh, trade is you have like a damage a flat damage and the damage amplifier that's like 1.5 seconds um delayed mm. in a sense and that's what it does so um that still comes down to a lot of burst actually due to the high flat damage at least it uh, used to be um used to work well like like a big burst you could see on on set release the trade was strong the um fights were basically all all over in like five to say uh, ten seconds like after one to two um, procs of the cannonballs. That also okay. means um, you can kind of look for AOE damage to just proc the um, proc the trait quite often. The higher the base damage, the more attractive uh, that is. For example, on nine, uh, just having your GP hit the whole board, but like his, his ship coming in uh, can be quite good uh, because you would proc uh, proc it on the whole board. That's also kind of why Nyla with triple RC is very good in that comp because she will whip the whole board. You will apply the cannonball, the flat damage every 1.5 seconds on the whole board. Just a quick interjection because it's something I've failed a couple of times as well, and Riot is very particular about it. Her name is Nila. Nila. Okay. Nila. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was okay. gonna. I will say. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like like the body part knee Nila. That's how I remember it. I think it's the only thing they've ever come back to us in Amir and like told us off yeah. of doing. Yeah. Which is a good quote, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alright, well, that's, just... that's good stuff. Does anyone have any other stuff you want to put in on this? Just, just to piggyback off of that, with it being like he was uh, with Loesh is saying about you know GP hitting whole board, things like that. Um, the comp, when it was doing more, when it was more dominant, it was relying, it relies heavily on more perfect items than maybe other compositions. Like okay. Miss Fortune really really needs blue buff because then she's casting more often and proccing the cannonballs more often. Same for Neela needing RFC. So it feels like a composition which is a little more dependent on having best in slot as of at least right now. It will be buffed. Likely before the GSC, though. Yes. I'm it's also out of relevance. Yeah, also also positioning like, is very yeah. important for it. But yeah, the DMF blue buff was also it was like an insta cast, and that like means like immediately yeah. burst. You can kind of immediately take down the front line um, and some surrounding units, and that also means that you really need armor pen because uh, the sh uh, the the trade damage is AD based. So um, you really need the armor pen in the composition, and that usually will be your shroud, like the Eva shroud, uh, Eva shroud on um, your front line, which most likely is Nautilus. And Nila uh, can also carry an RC because she will kind of AOE the front line at the same time. Um, that kind of builds uh, and, into and what... last whisper. I mean, sorry. Well, oh, yeah. No, it's cool. Um, I was just gonna say that kind of. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say that builds into what I think I'm most interested in the trait on paper. Which is that you have a AP carry in the form of misfortune, say at the three cost level, and that leads to a lot of reliable mixed damage within the trait innately. And so as a result, it's hard to itemize defensively against because you have to deal with the strong AP damage of certain carries versus the AD damage that's coming in from the cannonballs. 
is not something that was too strong during the Nila release, kind of, where everyone's just building triple RFC windshield wipers all over the place. But as the trait kind of grows and develops, we start seeing players experiment more with misfortune. I'm really curious to see how that relationship kind of builds. Oh, you go sort of frontline gargoyle hyper yeah. tank. That kind of oh. um, nullifies all the AoE. Makes you very vulnerable to um, Cassandra, obviously. Um, so that can be an interesting tech you can think about. But uh, for that, we'll have to wait and see how the comms are, will be getting refined and how the matchups will resolve. Yeah. I just also, I have to say, I'm not sure what you said about the, the tank. Sorry, I was fighting my cat who was knocking things over. I didn't want to make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you kind of like you're playing around AoE, um, in in the bilge water comp, and then like bursting the the front line, like multiple front line targets at the same time, so you can kind of work around it with uh, one very big because it's also very bursty. Second point, actually, um, you can play around that by having one very big beefy tank, and then you can utilize, for example, stone plate to, to kind of play around the AP damage coming in from the GPO from the MF, um, okay. and also the small chip damage coming in from units like TF Nautilus. Cool. Um, and then one more thing I would like to highlight is the um, synergy between the units because you do have quite a lot of AoE and you have stuff like Nautilus pulling them in together um, that kind of some mm. neat stuff you have the MF also like reducing all the shields at the beginning like uh, so you kind of you burn the shields then you pull them in and then you can uh, go like TF ulti Nyla whips uh, GP ships so it works yeah. it feels well uh, it looks it looks satisfying and it feels satisfying, I feel. And I feel because of the nature of the comp, with you were saying misfortune, take, um, obviously shredding sh the shields and so much burst coming through, some of the stall compositions of maybe aren't as strong anywhere, but we're really struggling against it when it was strong. Things like invokers right now aren't really viable too much, but um, compositions that like to take a long time, build up, have a lot of shielding, heal, heals, things like that. Of um, stacking archangels, for example, really struggled into this because you, your body's just gone straight away. Shields are gone. Front lines just instantly deleted. So it does well into stall compositions because it just it's too fast for them. Okay. That's why I think that the uh, positioning part is very important because, uh, like for the cast, it's uh, very very good um, to present how good players play around that, right? Um, because you have tanks that don't really rely on shields. And if you have uh, tanks that rely on shields, for example, the Tarek uh, Shen compos uh, mm -hmm. composition, you really want to split them, even though you waste yeah. the, the Tarek shield. So I think that's very good for casts if you uh, really pronounce how good players try to uh, play around the AoE. Especially also for uh, gangplank because uh, he can be baited to basically waste his uh, ultimate completely. Yes. Okay. If you want to add like two s small details for each uh, unit, misfortune usually the the misfortune ult is uh, on a five hex radius. If you see someone putting a misfortune on a on a corner, she's gonna miss half of the, of the DPS because she's gonna ult the first unit that it's. In, that it's in top of her and one of the two parts of the X is not going to do any damage. Uh, so that's why a, a lot of people, when Bilge Water was more meta, what they were started doing was just putting one unit in the center and the other tanks either on the far right and far left or behind. So they, they wouldn't get the initial burst and cast. And I also like the some just to add about the, the Nautilus as the main tank because he amplifies the resistances that he has, because his passive makes it that 30% of his armor and MR is... Uh, he gains 30% more armor and MR, I mean, so mm. even Shroud, Gargoyle, and all those things are even better for him. Yeah, well, that's very easy to miss. Cool. And Any more stuff about... Just by your read. Due, due to Nautilus with his cast bringing units together as well, with the composition having a lot of AoE, things like GP and Misfortune that want to hit big clumps. Even if the people maybe position in a way to separate their front line, it, it can be countered by having Nautilus yeah. positioned to bring them back together, and then the AoE still lands. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a really good thing to watch out for. 
I think the the fact that um, it was too strong for release is uh, a big problem for casts because uh, you kind of want to play with a new trade and have fun with it, and it's also uh, visually in interesting. So usually you you would want to celebrate the cannonballs coming in, but after the release, everybody is kind of tilted about it. So I think <laughs> it's not not easy to f uh, find the uh, correct approach for that. Okay. Yeah, I think we still haven't seen maybe the like the positioning factor of it being as reliant because it was just so strong that it, like it was just it it, so dominant. Yeah, yeah, it didn't matter really. So I yeah, think but, we will see this down the line. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But like if if somebody like say we play a tournament right now, Bridgewater is weak, but somebody is uh, still playing it because it's um he's high rolling the spot right I don't know, uh, hits not lost to misfortune too. And then you kind of want to have fun with it because he's uh, changing his strategy, uh, <laughs> goes to uh, for Bilgewater despite it being weak. And then you cannot really hype it up because everybody is so annoyed by it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there anything in terms of like um, more sort of uh, the trait construction or anything that people want to highlight for an interesting? Like in terms of the cost spread and the uh, the tags that the uh, the trait has, the be the benchmarks right like, like reaching seven via four cost if you have a plus one. Also, you can build the spatula is also important. And uh, again, playing for nine build water, I guess. Yeah, I mean Riot loves to tout how they want spatula emblems to be very transformative. And I feel like this is certainly kind of like a return to form of what that really means. Because just, again, being able to activate these cannonballs in more instances is a very enticing fantasy. Yeah, They're probably, it, the, the comp is probably going to get to a point where the five fields water is going to be a good mid-game comp, but they don't want to push the seven to be as strong because the the thought of having Eloy 1, Twisted Fate 1 making 5k damage is not something that they probably want to have in this game. So I think the plus 1 is going to be really strong, especially for the mid game. But the, the 7 and 9, the threshold is going to be interesting to see how it, it evolves in the future. Uh, we can discuss the uh, early mid game thing actually by talking a bit about the numbers. Um, because you see the the base number, like the flat damage, um, is more powerful in the early game. So um, if you look at how the trade is constructed, the uh, flat damage part will become less relevant as the game goes on, while the percentage damage dealt will become more relevant. And that okay. kind of is like so. You have to watch how these um, how these numbers are balanced uh, to see the relevance of the trade. Um, but I mean, for now, like. Both thresholds are not good enough for consistent play. Uh, so we kind of have to wait and see how they decide to um, approach the trade for a more healthy spot going forward. I think they'll try to keep it balanced because that's usually their approach. They don't like it when things are very strong early and then just come almost irrelevant late game. You could see that with like electro charge scaling and stuff like that. Um, but still, it's uh, something because the the early tournaments won't have it be in a very refined spot, so this may be something we can keep an eye on, um, oh, comparing think... the flat damage versus oh, the damage yeah, scaling. I think longer down the road we might see a situation where it becomes good for mid-game, then on 7 kind of meh, unless you have a really good lineup for it, but 9 could still be a situation where if you are able to get it together, it is going to be a very strong comp, and I think that would be the ideal place for this trade to come out on top of where we don't see that a lot with other trades that if you can get two emblems that it's actually like quite strong so coming back to um, what was just said i think this is going to be how they finalize it once we finish this patch or once we get closer to like finals and the regionals mm -hmm. okay so sort of I like a spike and then sort of slow down a bit and potentially have that potential for a really strong late game, but it's not presumably never going to be guaranteed. 
I think it's going to be like a situation where if somebody has like, a, let's say, a two bilge water start, you're going to get excited for it because there's a p potential that they build out mm. the nine rather than just flexing in five um, with like a different comp. And I think that is going to be a narrative that could be quite fun and that could be very much on brand for what they usually do. Yeah. Cool. Uh, ideally, it'll be a, a way to get to the more expensive units, right? Like you wouldn't want to see a late game board still running allowy twisted fear these types of units whereas at the start of the patch when it was too strong you just kept all of them in so yeah i think you're right and it, it should be over the nine a, a mid-game comp to get you to a the, these five costs that you would much rather run so hopefully mm -hmm. okay. and then to touch on the spatula again, um, it is actually relevant which unit is holding the spatula, because um, because you you can proc the the trade. It's not like just I give it whichever unit and then I get my plus one on the trade, um, mm -hmm. but you can kind of decide on a, a unit that has huge AOE to just proc the vertical or a unit which reduced burst. Like for example, you can use it as a damage amp on like a single target um, unit to get rid for uh, of for example the mega tank that's trying to counter you. So uh, deciding on who will hold the uh, bilge water spatula can be very, very interesting and relevant. Okay. So yeah. So AOE, shred, or single target damage. Cool. I like it. All right. Anything else before we move on to other stuff? I don't. I don't think so. It's covered quite a lot on bilge. Cool. I suspect I just... a lot of the other ones will be a lot shorter. Yeah, I was just going to say really quickly, have we, has anyone identified particularly interesting spatula holders for uh, Build Rotter? Nothing outside oh. of the normal, like the units that kind of fit. Yeah. Um, yet, like for example, if you would go like Azir. Um, I experimented a bit with like Nessus because he can kind of, he steals stats, right, and can be kind of AoE. Um, that might be interesting, or maybe stuff like Ash, because she usually procs a lot in the backline, but then again, it's not really worth it to to play a unit just for the proc as of right now, because you will not kill some uh, anything in the backline just based off like a single proc um, of the of the instant, even if it's nine bilge water. So um... they're um, looking at the stats for it. It looks like Jarvan's doing pretty okay. Always the most, I think, the most popular one with it. But it looks like otherwise it's kind of juggernauts, uh, presumably yeah. for the combo. Yeah, one they, they just fit the comp, right? Yeah, yeah. because you... Darius, you get Vanquisher in as well for your Nihilus, so it, it, often people splash that in. Also, stats uh, for DC are a little weird because if you want to play 7 builds water at 7, you usually only have one open slot, and it's usually the second juggernaut for an Autilus or the Jarvan 4, so. Mm. There is a, it's a little skewed on the yes. on the stats here. Also, if you go also, for yeah, also if you go for the vertical, usually what you're lacking is frontline rather than carries because you do have the Nyla, you do have DMF, you do have like TF and Graves and even Gangplank, which is more of a carry than a trade as he is balanced right now. Um, so yeah, you want to fill in on frontline rather than more carries. That's um that's another one of those things that will probably be, would be very useful to have as part of like discussion for about these traits is stuff like that saying that you know this trait doesn't have a lot of frontline built into it like just relatively straightforward ideas like that are still worth us having here so that the kind of discussion starts from there without having to work up to it. Uh, but cool. Uh, all right. If there's no more to say about that, then we'll probably just start going through these ones relatively quickly. Uh, so, Damasia, how are folks feeling about Damasia at the moment? I think the change to a fixed item is good. Um, it, when they first did it on PBE and uh, Kale got rage played every game, that was a little problematic. <laughs> but uh, I think it's long term better that they, you know they, you know what you're going to get on each Damasia unit, and it, it feels more, more much more reliable to play. So. That's really the only massive change, right? But it, I think it 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 allows you to toggle them like differently as well. Like if you are playing Kale and there's a lot of people playing Cho'Gath reroll, uh, you know that you're gonna have a Demon Slayer to be able to shred those high HP tanks. So I think 
it allows players to kind of plan out their game a little easier. Mm, yeah, I like that, Tim. That's the most important part because you basically um, it also gives you a lot of item flexibility because you you know what you need to build around and you also only need two items to complement mm -hmm. your carry item there. Uh, I think it's most notable on Fiora, which makes her very, very easy to uh, to build for because you can very quickly focus on itemizing your secondary carry. Most cases, a Kaiser or Quinn in the Demersia version, or maybe like a Mordekaiser. And then that um, usually well, helps you reaching very good items, I feel like. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I think it's a uh, very... Uh, uh, sorry. That's fine. Please, Karim. Um, I think it's very interesting to talk about the mid-game for Demacia, like just if it happens in a game, because usually you have so many options uh, between uh, the, the Slayer opening, and also you usually want to support your Poppy by putting a Bastion. So in mid-game, you have really a ton of uh, possibilities. Uh, for um, Leisure Set, usually you go for um, the Challenger setup, but there's so many possibilities. Uh, depending on balance as well, obviously, but uh, Mordekaiser can uh, work very well. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a very interesting mid game. Mm. Some more niche uh, item because you can kind of choose what item you need, so you can kind of adapt on the depending on your matchups. And if you then consider you need a strong solo frontline or a strong main tank, you can kind of go for the poppy with the um, radiant vow. I don't know the name. Uh, something like Oath. Um, but Ooh, for example, Galio. Cool. Oh, yeah, thank you. Something uh, like the Galio, for example, he will always get the Radiant Redemption. And uh, that is just very, very good against compositions, for example, like Invokers, um, where you reduce AoE damage when, and you also AoE heal your team. So this can be like quite a powerful tech for certain matchups. Mm. No, that's great. I wouldn't even, I would not have thought of that. So that's really cool. And one uh, kind of niche uh, thing is the binary um, was buffed quite a lot uh, because you always get tailored items and it can be very good for Demacia because you get so many uh, items as well. Nice. Oh, it's awkward to use though because then um, what you kind of want to do is you want your Demacia items on like units with one item and then get the, the third item via binary but then your other Dem Demacia units you can't give them three components because then they will get the Demacia uh, item. So it's the um, just yeah. a the tweet that was posted the the list of items it is slightly outdated because oh Poppy is it doesn't okay. get gargoyle anymore she gets a vow. Yeah, it's on Poppy changed on the big yeah, patch. Yeah. Oh, okay. I had it okay. in the sheet. No, oh, thank you, Barry. Yeah. Uh, I was also just going to quickly add in the Damascian War Mogs that Jarvan now gets really yes. quick. Yes, oh, please do. Mm -hmm. This is definitely going to be uh, holes in what I've written out notes wise. So please keep me honest with this because I do not. Or not, that, that's the only change for now. <laughs> if something changes in the future, I'll will ping you. Don't worry. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Also, I, I believe this is still a thing, but. I'm 99% sure that if you give uh, Aatrox the Damasian emblem, he loses the Radiant item whenever he reses. I oh, know really? this was an issue... Yes, this was an issue in the previous uh, 9.0. It was an issue when I tested it on PBE for 9.5. I haven't seen anything that says that's changed. Okay. What the, is there a... Oh, I see. So this list is... Is this list telling you what they get from a uh, Damasian emblem? If they have the Damasian spot. Yeah. 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 Okay, Jesus every Christ. Champion. So, for example, Mordekaiser gets one of his best items, um, like in insanely good. So, a lot of the time, if you see a Damasius spat, people and people want to run Mordekaiser because you get two Slayer anywhere with the trait. Okay, so that, that's a common route. Oh, jeez. I suppose we'll probably yeah, we said it a few times. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say we said it a few times, but Slayers just feels really good with Damasia now that it's in built. But I'm fairly certain there will be some other niche uh, setups with the Marcia spots in the near future. But uh, I'm also very quite certain they're not quite done with the Radiant item balance yet for this set. So um, this will be something that we'll have to look on depending on the patch. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, in terms of 
yeah, so we, I guess we kind of touched briefly on the old Slayer thing. Uh, in terms of, like, the... Uh, the change from, so you're losing Juggernaut on Sorcerer, adding the Slayer in, and Challenger, is there anything, like, outside of that we want to go into with Demacia, or is that or everything? I think we're good. Yeah, Demacia is a very flexible line right now, so there's a lot of possibilities with it. I mean, the only other thing I can kind of think of is the general resistances changes that we've seen, where all these levels of the Demacia units have received a little less armor and magic resist to compensate for their being less shred. But mm. from what I've kind of seen, it seems like that's kind of had more of a... You know, things are roughly the same. Like, the shred's gone down, the resistances have gone down, nothing's kind of become too overpowering. No, that's like an mm, open discussion part later. Yeah, that's also true too. Yeah. We'll, we'll learn more about that as time goes on. Because there's like a lot more implications, and then this is like one of the appliances, I would say. Uh, the Panda Comp? <laughs> it's what he played to come to Masters. Yeah, because they're both three cost slayers, so you can, oh, okay. you re can reroll Quinn and Rex at the same time. Um, and individ individually, they struggle as carries, but it is uh, quite viable if you get plus one slayer or something like that. I will nice. say that I've had also I've also had a lot of success running that when I'm just generally running Rexai reroll and if I need to shift things around in the early to mid game I pivot to that and still do very well. Okay, yeah, cool. With Demacia it feels like there's quite a few different lines. There's the three cost Quinn reroll, standard kill variant. You can just run three for in a Fiora Challenger setup. So there's a lot of different ways to play it. The Panda Comp. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Okay. He had tweeted about it. There was like a like a day or two after set release. He was like, "I have been gaining infinite LP with this," and linked linked it. And like, I think three days later, people caught on to it. Yeah, he he smurfed with it. He was a small trendsetter there. Oh. <laughs> Didn't he? Wasn't he one of the first folks to hit uh, top five in yeah. Spain? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was like, uh, he was like rank four in the EU, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was really cool. high. Cool. Oh, I'll have to, try. I'll get the, have to give that a try. All right. Uh, fun. So I guess we'll uh, let's talk about Freljord then. Uh, what have, I guess this is going to le include some of the general resistance talk or shred talk. I was going to say, that's a perfect transition. Yeah, I know, right? Well, we, can, plan that out. we can. We can. I, I think we can save the resistance thing. Either we can do it now and then we just sw switch in general, or we wait with that until the end. And then very would be a good thing uh, to talk or include in that. But besides that, I think it's there's not really anything interesting in Freljord. It's basically still functions the same. They just removed Lissandra, so you have like one more less trade to fill. No. I think the thing that sort of leapt out for me is the idea that, you know, previously you could access it relatively early in the game, uh, and now it's like it's only locked behind either very specific circumstances or, or much, much later. Yeah, a bit harder to access, I guess, yeah. Uh, oh, I feel like it's uh, no fun at all anymore because um, usually you just really don't want to put it in, like uh, what composition really wants to go for Freyjord. And uh, you don't have any decisions to make whether you, you need the uh, additional Lissandra in it. It's just mm -hmm. either you have it or you have, uh, don't have it because you don't need the shred. <laughs> we can tell, we can say in the cast, they made the trade worse, it's shit now, it's boring. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I really feel like yeah, that's always uh, good trade. advice. I'm sure they would love that. <laughs> but uh, I feel like it's uh, difficult to talk about uh, Freyot at all because it feels it doesn't feel uh, fun to um, put it in. Yeah, well, I, you yeah. can you can kind of see that, but that goes into the whole shred and uh, thing again because um, it became less relevant as well because there is more consistent access to shred due to yeah. items. But uh, yeah, again, and we, we, we would kind of need to pivot to the other topic for that to make more sense. Yeah, I with, mean, uh, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, utility traits are always kind of uh, a bit wonky, where sometimes they could be slotted in really effectively, and others, like here, where 
yes, Sejuani is awesome, but you're going to be putting here more in just bruiser front lines to get more bruisers. You're not, I think, in too many circumstances, excited to throw the Ash in as well for those resistances. So, like, okay. I, I'm also a little skeptical of how it's kind of shifted around, especially when you have, granted, less consistent, but other more interesting utility options with Ishtal coming through. All I was going to say is I think at some point during the set, we will see Freljord getting more play when the brute two bruiser front line is more viable. Right now, Juggernaut has been so dominant as the go-to front line in so many compositions that people aren't running Sejuani unless it's just vertical bruisers. So I think at some point, Sejuani will likely be in a better spot. Um, running just two bruiser will be a more opted for option and then we'll probably see it come back in but right now with brute sejuani being like much less popular than the likes of nasus it feels even extra harder to run because you have to give up your front line so, it's also yeah. lovely, uh, very weird to fit everything in because vanquisher and bruiser aren't really two traits that mesh really well together because if you want the two you want the vanquishers you usually want to play Ionius, because you want Jean, you want Saya, you want maybe you want Nila, I guess. And how do you fit? You fit Sehuani plus plus what? That's the the question that that's gonna be remain to be seen because it's it's gonna be maybe eventually it's gonna be a comp with that, but not having a third option in the Ferelder tree really really hurts. Ash reroll. It's coming. It, it'll arrive. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard yeah. surprisingly strong thoughts on Ash reroll. It yeah. feels so weird based on the history of the unit where it went from having absolutely zero scaling from star level to star level to having at least some, I guess. Like, I, I, do not put any stock into this. Like, do not go out and invest in Ash reroll <laughs> just yet. I'm but I, I right have now. heard a couple. Oh no! I, I have heard a couple of people whisper that there might be something to it. Okay, so the person I want to shout out for it is a uh, Paisanos or Kindle Gem, the NA player that was in the Worlds qualifier, um, the last chance one, but um, just missed out. Is an Ash reroll believer, so it might oh. at some point <laughs> see some. More talk was for a little bit too, I think, until he rage quit with it on stream. I think. <laughs> yes, I think I saw that clip. All right, cool. Uh, any thoughts on it being, I guess, theoretically less of a commit to hit the full version of Freljord? Like, uh, with an emblem? That... I mean, if you need CC, if you can't hit anything else and you get access to an emblem, it's fine. But Yeah, we'll have to I think see. if you're taking the emblem from, like, a tome or something, you're... it's probably because you've missed what you were aiming for. Like... Most okay. of the time, it's but like, I mean, it, they, you'd never feel that bad about it. But it's, yeah, I don't think this might change yeah. if they change numbers. To yeah. be honest, so I, I don't think it's interesting to talk about. If it's strong, you will know. Yeah, I'm, it is a hell of a consolation prize, as you're kind of saying. Like uh, being able to have that kind of consistent shred, it might even tempt you to go throw in the ash as a uh, extra unit. But I, I agree. I think in most cases, just due to the differences we have between the other traits here, we're probably just going to see Emblem plus Sejuani more so than Ash being thrown in. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, let's move on. Uh, I was going to say, see, we thought we wouldn't be able to talk about Froyor at all, and we did for like six minutes. Good job, everyone. <laughs> all right. Ionian. Uh, so, I mean, the thing I've made there is, yeah, this is the thing that's already been mentioned. So we've got the Vanquisher and Invoker, like, I think it might be unique in having two internal synergies. I, I think it's the same as last set. You just replace challengers with bank wishers, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's well, not an awful lot to talk about. Zaya is Yasuo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More consistent, um, I guess, because sometimes, sometimes your Yasuo would just... Would just troll and throw you the fight, but uh, I mean, I think Zai is rising in prominence a little bit. Did you see where the feathers fly? Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I said There's... more consistent, I didn't say too consistent. <laughs> Zai as a champion is very interesting, like, uh, what items you need and uh, what synergy is most important, or uh, also around uh, the uh, Darius, uh, who, who can fit uh, quite well. I think there's just a lot of um, stuff you can talk about, uh, Zaya. 
Yeah. Also, there's uh, Jin Rerule. So I think uh, Unia in general is very interesting. A lot of uh, stuff uh, that can happen. I didn't mean Jin Rerule like, existed in the last set. It was just bad. Yeah, so it didn't. Uh, <laughs> no. Oh. Okay, if you're, well, let's... if you're a true believer in the deal list, you, you played it last set. <laughs> oh, no, we're getting to deal list territory. We're, we're definitely off track. Uh, I think the only thing from a casting perspective is just uh, keeping in mind that the uh, ult is called the Feather Strike. Like, I imagine it's probably going to be a fairly big moment in a lot of casts when, you know, if she gets off a big ult, so just knowing what it's called. Oh. I think oh, it's also, worthwhile. yeah, for for play by play casting, uh, remember to shout feathers fly when the Xayah ults, especially <laughs> if it's like Xayah three. Yeah, people love that. Yeah, yeah. If anyone has think... any like, uh, I'm not making this the focus of this. I think it might make it a different workshop of like how to play by play the different ones. But uh, that's other, a good point. Other than um, oh, we've mentioned so far about Ionia, <laughs> I think. The, Sorry, the other thing to, to no. The other thing to mention is just it's in a similar spot to it was last set in terms of the value of the spatula. It's one of the if you can get it. Obviously, last time round it was Callista's uh, uh, Kaiser was the user with Challenger mm. being so, so natural. Now um, Neela re really likes the spatula, so it it is one where if somebody gets plus one Ionia or gets the spatula, it's it, it the composition becomes much much more viable. So. Uh, is the same I'm as before, remember. really. Is the spatula still buildable? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same in that sense. So the trade really, like, the, it, 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 I feel it plays exactly the same as well. Yeah. It <laughs> plays the Callista and the Kaiser with, like, Anila and Darius, and that's it. Okay. And that's also a good, a good thing to know, because you'll, you'll have, since you'll have the Challenger trade in the, in the sheet, I'm just going to mention it quickly. Uh, the fact that Jesuo, Jesuo doesn't exist anymore makes the line even better to play now because before it's like you were you actually had to have Irelia and Yasuo at the same time for the comp to have a solid ground to stand on and now mm. Irelia can come in, can go out, it's just you can just flex around it and maybe you can even pivot into the comp and instead you, of before. You have the same with Jin now kind of. Like yeah, Jin now, is Irelia. So Exactly, yeah. It depends. Uh, but it, but I feel like Vanquish is not as important of a vertical um, as Challenger is. But that will well, we will have to wait and see how they balance the numbers. But it's also more convenient because you can basically build items on Jin just uh, to transfer them to Zaya later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one to four is very rough con transition though. But well, yeah, you can in theory. And there's uh, the bus obviously as well. That can be. Uh, Juggernaut composition, but also Yonia. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's okay. also, I don't think, too new. I think for Xayah, you can kind of say that she's doing armor pen on her flat armor pen on her cast. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Just remember that. And I think everything else. All right. Same as uh, last I want to get onto uh, Ishtar because I figure there's probably going to be a bit more to say here. Yes. Uh, so. We've got in there again. The, uh, I think Milio is the only one where we've got a ability name that's worth knowing. The Ultra Mega Far Kick. Uh, but into, I imagine the main meat here is probably going to be just in talking about which of the each style variants work well for different things. Did I miss out one? I feel like I did. I think those are all. Yeah, you... fire. 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 I missed that far. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is a red buff for Morello, basically, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, I think it's very iffy right now with all the extra trades because I don't think they are in that good of a spot right now. And usually you just play it in the compositions where it kind of fits naturally. And then you most of the time just take what you get. But I yeah. haven't really seen like, oh, it's this X star. I'll abuse this weird comp. I haven't really seen that yet. So there will probably be a lot more interesting stuff down the road. Also, I think the that problem that. is uh, the problem is um, the invoker um, weakness in general because uh, there's a lot of interesting lines around Tarek and uh, Soraka. But if uh, invoker is not viable, that doesn't work. 
Yeah, you could also like I tried like wind on Xaya, but it's just not worth it to play the units to give uh, your Xaya a wind field. It's or Nyla. So it's a bit rough. The the only time I've had success of splashing wind was um when I was playing an Aphelios like a vertical bastion board, so it's only one extra unit. And mm. I didn't have a rage blade, so I was kind of like, "This is, <laughs> this yeah. is my bailout option." So I think wind will have a few spots where, um, if you are really lacking attack speed on a carry or something like that, then yeah. you will play it. Like for me, I was I would I would be most interested in electric because I think that's really interesting. Uh, stuff like Quinn, for example, or Javan are like the outliers here, big AOE units, right? with not too much mana or semi-consistent casts. Um, but I, I just don't feel like we've really seen all that much of x style yet. Like, there's a lot of potential, but it's just not utilized properly yet. There's a Ladakh video about it, so maybe that improves Yes, I was about now. to say that. <laughs> He'll cook something up. Mm. The, uh, well, do you want to tell them about the video in brief? Oh, he's talking about the uh, ice because uh, my mic microphone is uh, acting up. Um, because the true damage is just a ton of damage, and you can combine it with the one of the new items. And I can't remember the name. Thorax? No. <laughs> oh, the uh, the night harvester. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. Sense. The point of what he was saying. Uh, was that yes it currently this effect can be amplified by outside sources so you can you can spam percentage increases oh, that's cool and it's, and it's also it's also based on their maximum health so the duck was playing loads of really low health units so that they would proc immediately and just blow up the board uh, that can't may... keep getting away with this <laughs> yeah i think that <laughs> might change because it seems really silly for the most part it feels like as a trait, Ixtel's just really been playing along, like I mentioned before, the units that naturally come with it. Uh, you see, basically, they play it, they play it in Rogue Reroll, but other than that, there's not many compositions where you want to splash it in. So It has that splash potential, though, I think, because yeah, I mean, I think... Nico with the Bastion can go in a lot of different, as we were talking about before, uh, these Nico uh, Terra kind of front lines. Um, we've seen, as uh, already noted for some of these elements here, like, uh, if you see you have early wood, that just means, okay, let's try to go for Cho'Gath to get some kind of crazy uh, uh, composition kind of going there. And I'll say that I've had success on Electric, actually, going through um, getting these kinds of consistent early stuns that, now that Froyord's out of the way, is a really big way to disrupt the early game. And I've one fights I really shouldn't have just off of that trade on its own. Okay. Yeah, you can yeah, try Quinn on that. That's good. Since Rogue is meta, I'm a fan of Electric Katarina, so shields and stuns oh, okay. the whole board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, admittedly, most of my time of this has been playing the, um, the super kind of reroll where you're rerolling uh, Cho, Renekton, Cass, Milio, like basically everyone, kind of. So. Mm, sometimes it's a uh, kale as well, like a, a behind. Yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of ridiculous just how many one costs you can buy and have a relatively viable falling off in the late game kind of composition, I guess. Yeah. Well, the I've I've had some at my limited level. I've had some success with the stone one as well for the rogues. Like having the thrill mm. of the hunt on the rogues is just absolutely bonkers if you can if you've got enough damage to get the kills. Uh, okay, is there anything else that people want us? It sounds like it's still a little up in the air what people think about Ishtar, right. but is there anything else that people want to put in before we move on? I think just from a casting perspective, it's basically if it's wood, there's going to be a lot more people angling towards Cho, and anything else, I don't think it'll instantly influence someone's decision in the game, right now at least. Like, okay. Wood is, the one, wood is the one to me at least where it stands out as people are going to play differently because of this Ixtar, whereas the others are just kind of if someone's going to play rogue anywhere they just will so i think it's like i, I would assume for the next big uh, tournaments we're gonna have some balance changes and 
Um, I think we we should have uh, the opportunity to see Nico as well um, way stronger. So then uh, Wood and uh, Stone get more interesting. Ice maybe as well. Electric is very, very good for Nico as well. And like on PPE, Nico was quite viable. And it's also a trait that uh, works pretty well with um, Wolf setups. So if there are more compositions that rely on spatulas, we will see more Excel as well. And then maybe more Nico. Oh, sorry, why is that? Sorry? Uh, sorry, why why would the I didn't quite I didn't quite follow what you what you meant. Okay, so if like uh, Sastra, for example, is very, very strong now, and uh, you want Spatula for that, um, if there are more compositions that uh, rely on Spatulas, we're gonna see more Uf as a legend, hmm. and then we see more Ixtal as well because that's one of the uh, strong early outcomes. If you have um, Nico uh, package or uh, Milio two. Uh, even Kiana is enough, I think, to just uh, go into the line. Okay. And then, yes. like that, all that relies on uh, Bastion being stronger. I mean, it's theory crafting right now rather than like. Yeah, but I, I'm just yeah. saying that that Nico as a champion is very uh, like like a big um, focal point if the balance uh, shifts toward toward that at all, and I think it has to. Because okay. like uh, best Bastion's not working at all um, in comparison to Juggernaut, it's not a state that uh, should stay like this. Okay, uh, let's. In the interest of time, let's uh, move on a bit. Like Noxus, I don't imagine we'll have a massive amount to say about it. But uh, what do people feel no, about that? In brief? Like, ignoring like meta strength right now, in terms of just purely from a casting perspective, when it's back in meta, if you know, um, I don't think it plays really any more much differently it is very similar to it was before um early roll downs to strengthen board things like that so i don't think there's a, a lot to say really okay uh anyone disagree or should we move on i agree no i agree uh, I what about the, only... the uh, blue buff samara with the um nefiri yes that's a bit oh, of a special like build yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's a meme build. But uh, if that works out, we'll uh, we'll know. Oh, like, I guess... There's a dark video in it. You can see it. It's kind of <laughs> like a, a niche tech where you um, the the Nafiri uh, when she dies, she gets uh, well on cast eighty procs for the unit as closest. So you kind of have to yolo position your Samira um, mm. to like get her the buff early. Sack this Nafiri with like as much de death blades as you can, and then the Samira will do very improved damage. But uh, right now it's not very consistent. Um, it will be like a small part of the enormous Samira gameplay when that uh, Samira regroup gameplay, when that becomes viable. But uh, I'm pretty sure if it's meta, um, you will know. And if it's not meta, it's enough if you've heard about it existing. Okay. Uh, the only thing I'd want to put in there is, yeah, just noting the change breakpoints. So there's potential for it to be a little bit more flexible than it was previously, and the more Kaiser ultimate being called God of Death. Uh, so trying to figure out how to work that in is going to be interesting. But it's a bit of an awkward ability name. Uh, anyway, uh, Piltover. That doesn't really seem like that's very much changed at all. I think that the the two things that are maybe different from set nine with Piltover is. Um, it's a little bit more viable to do the win streak reroll piltover of Jace, Echo, Jinx. It's that's something you might see. It's not always going to be full open now, even though the majority of the time it will be. And then I think the other thing would be that it has a AP out with Silco, um, whereas it was always piltover, often led into just an AD composition. If you end up with AP items as well, you can run Silco as a secondary carry when you cash mm. out. So. Yeah, I that was those are, those are the big changes for it. That was the thing I really wanted to focus on, just because there's it's been basically a very open secret that uh, Piltover has had a Zeri problem for the entirety of uh, 9.0, where that was really the only off ramp you kind of had if you were staying in the Piltover lane. I think Silco gives you an interesting AP option. I feel like you can get some pretty cool gunners kind of involved with Jace also being able to stand on his own a little bit now too, and being a bit more selfish with the way his ability works um i think it's a success for what they want to do i'm just curious if uh 
that's kind of felt by others. Okay. I'll, we'll, I've, we've just got a lot of stuff to get through, so I'll, I'll move us yeah, sorry. We'll, we'll have yeah. to see, because right now the um, well, the base units are too broken, and then the kind of line is too dominant once again. But like, if it also changes, perfect. if it stays, you'll just have the standard Aphidius comp that can fit this, and then that's it. Wait, we don't have a meta discussion channel. Let's yes. solve that. Whoop, done. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, I think we'll move some of the more in-depth discussion to there, because I'd love to have it. I'm just also aware of, like, that we're already butting up against the amount of time we said it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, Targon, any thoughts on there? I think for Targon and Void, from a casting perspective, there's not, not much to say, really. They're both unchanged in a sense of it. I know Felix looked trait changed, but they feel in, in a similar spot, um, splashing tag on when needed outside of just running it alongside the, the Felios. Yes. So I feel like both these two traits haven't really changed from a casting point of view too much. Okay, I'm prepared to accept that so we can jump <laughs> past it to Zorn. Yep. Uh, so it's really interesting because the... Um, Right now, it's not really viable. Um, at least I'm not seeing it because it's very hard to access. But if someone plays uh, six Zorn, that will be really interesting. Um, you will get two Zorn emblems on four. Uh, that's quite the interesting breakpoint. Um, you'll have to consider that um, you can only access the defensive components, uh, like the defensive Zorn mods, if you started offensive Zorn mod first. And um, if you don't start offensive Zorn mod first, um, you will need to go six six zone, which is very very rare. So there will usually be very very less frequent like um, texts where you put the Javan with the bomb in or the heating cyan and stuff like that. I mean, I'll say though the thing that I'm really excited about this is the fact that the chem mods overcharge at the two at the four piece version of the trait. Yeah. That has been this really cool aspect of this trait line that just never really gets a lot of attention because of how the rare people kind of went full vertical into Zon. Opening it up allows for a lot more interesting experimentation and especially following the changes they made to some of those items to make sure that they're more generally okay on all of these units. Like, uh, I think they made it so that the uh, vi viral Bioware is now just the first free instances of damage after you cast your ability that it triggers the damage amp. I think they did something with the uh oh I forget the name of the one that lets you potentially attack for free afterwards, but robotic I think arm it's robotic bonus, arm. It's AD yeah. bonus damage now or based bonus damage based on the AD damage. They did slight changes to all of them. Mm -hmm. Um but I don't think they changed the way they work fundamentally. Okay, it's worth noting that that's changed so we can... Yeah, but you check them out. Again. They all change. It's worth uh, thinking about it. You yeah. have to agree there. Okay, but cool. for now, probably we can skip that and see. Well, maybe we'll, Vertical Zone will be the new, new thing, but then you'll know anyways again. <laughs> yeah, I suppose this is a good point. Uh, what, do, what do people generally think about Silco? See, it does seem to be kind of like the throwing unit of the set. Yeah, he's just says overtuned right now. So that's and then he's really flexible. Yeah, so. he's not reliant on his traits yeah. um, co compared to some other carries. So it yeah. really feels like if you just have AP items, he is the splash in most scenarios. Sorry, okay. it's in the kitchen, but I was listening. Um, just because I heard it different versions now, I actually don't know. How do you mm -hmm. pronounce? I was saying Ixtal in my head, but I think, Peter, you were saying Ishtal? It's Ishtal. Like, what's a Ishtal? Yeah. Um, okay. it's, how Kiana, it's, how, it's how Kiana pronounces it in her voice lines in League mm -hmm. itself. Awesome. Um, okay. And I think oh. that X kind, I -X kind of thing is usually yeah. that uh, Ish in a lot of these other things that sort of show up for the trait, like the portals. Like, I think it's... Oh, I forget the name of the portal of like the capital city, like Ish Ishalkan. Ishalkan? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm pretty sure that's how that's pronounced too, say for example. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank oh, you. It's so I weird. It. Yeah, I, I was very confused to start off with this one. Uh, okay. Uh let's go on to, I've I started getting less more and more lazy as it went through this and I ran out of time. Uh Invokers. <laughs> it's okay. 
Uh, what are, what are people thinking about invokers at the moment? We've got a new eight invoker. I don't know if anyone's bothering to get that. There's there's just one. Yeah, it's like a new chase trait. It's cool if you can reach it, but it's probably very hard to reach. Uh, besides that, there is the one cost reroll line, which you now have with Melee and Cassie both at one cost. Uh, the other version feels practically the same. You just lost the Lissandra, so. Um, but besides that, you're still looking to itemize your Shen, add the Tarik, roll the Karma, add the Ari. That stays the same. So the interesting thing will be the one cost reroll option. Right now, it's one version of the Chogat reroll. Um, so we'll see how that one will develop once Chogat kind of gets a bit back in line. Um, besides hey, that. Eight invoker gets more viable with the uh, wolf as well, and that's pr pretty strong. So, so might be something to keep in mind. Yeah, it's like oh, sorry, yeah. you said that again. Didn't, didn't quite catch what you said. It's also depending on wolf again. If you uh, play more oh, wolf, yeah. or if invoker is stronger, um, it's also the bastion line, right? right? Uh, so there's yes. the combination always Ishtar. Um, Targon, all that uh, works uh, better if you have uh, Ulf as a legend. Yes. And then the the chase trade is very strong as well if you if you reach it. I suppose that's the that is one of the things that feels like it's significantly different for Invoker that is that it seems like now four Invoker is quite common in what I've been seeing people playing with it compared to what it was in the previous set. And it's a mid-game transition right now. We'll have to we'll have to see. Meta dependent. It yeah, just never think... it just never reached a viable point in the last set. I think it's interesting. Obviously, right, excluding it's not too strong in the meta right now. Um, I think at some point when it will be, then the only thing is the MF can sometimes be splashed in against it if you're struggling to get through shield. So yeah, that's good. I think I think it's not a viable composition right now to be honest but um when it is we may see mf as a splash to counter against it so okay also you thought oh no never mind all champions in there yeah if you if you spot anything especially the notes i'm making as well if i get anything wrong just please feel free to correct them actually the uh, two new arises are interesting in that regard uh, because especially the Bilgewater one got buffed so much. To be honest, I have no idea how strong it is right now, but but it should be uh, pretty pretty good if you get, uh, reach it early. I mean, it's a, it's another gold generator, right? So it works mm -hmm. a bit, uh, and it's also it's amplified by the more gold you have. So um, it kind of works in a similar way. The um, the Zorn rise functioning mm. it's just focused more on generating you more value rather than um producing large amounts of damages based off your gold so it's like a snowball you win more kind of thing and then the i think the really interesting one is the ishtar version where you uh, have this because it scales of it like rice goes down to i think one or two range and then you scale off of uh, armor and magic resistance so it's like this like this well there's like the duck video on it again uh, with the bastion, oh, yeah. um, but that's uh, it. The, it changes rise fundamentally, and I think that's interesting to note. So I'm really hoping that Invoker is viable for uh, big tournaments because, like the Bilgewater uh, stuff, is so much fun to cast. I think if if you see the chest drop and stuff like that, and people are not sick of it <laughs> in, in contrast to Bilgewater in general, so. I think if uh, Invoker is viable, that uh, will be a lot of fun if we have uh, Invoker lines in Bridgewater. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look at the... Uh, I didn't actually clock, I haven't clocked the Star Rise properly yet, so I'll have to... Also, I think the, the Rise is doing the... the Ishtar Rise is doing the Zyra old animation. Yes, that neat. would make sense. Especially since it's called Vines, and I'm like, hmm. Yeah, hmm. It, it looks really nice. Yeah, it's a lot. I think TFT is based almost entirely on code reuse, so that makes sense. Uh, okay, Rogue. How are people feeling about Rogue? It doesn't have as many dead units as it did in the past, so it, what I mean by that is 
the unit units like Z were carries that were dependent on on items, right? So if the, if you didn't itemize the rogues last set, the extra ones you were running for the trait didn't really do much. But um, you know, Kiana with the CC, um, Graves with the the chill, um, it has utility units that you don't have to itemize to get value out of, which I think is ni a nice change for the trait. Hmm. Good. No, really good point. So it actually works now. Yes, <laughs> coming from many, many fixes. And they can they re reworked the four uh, four breakpoint, uh, but I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, the uh, um, so yeah, so previously it was max HP it was doing. Now it's uh, just a. So I was until that's just like a damage amp. Yes. Like you're getting sixty percent bonus damage, but it's coming over it's a bleed. period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is Rogue Four? Uh, I mean, assuming that from the the competition being played, that people are generally happy with with where a Rogue Four is at the moment. Oh, people are not happy with it, but it's getting played and it's good. Okay. Because it's still like a assassin problem, right? It feels horrible to lose against that. It's, uh... But it's now actually a composition, I think, is probably yes. the better way of thinking yes. about it. That's As supposed to a meme. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, really good, really good point on that one, Barry. Uh, Slayer. Anyone got stuff to say about Slayer? I mean, we've sort of covered it indirectly already a bit. Mm -hmm. But... Well, the, uh, you can't build the spat anymore. And then we covered a bit of the units, um, like Mordekaiser, um, really likes extra range. That's something, one thing to note. Yeah, it feels like without, that, uh, without plus one range, he runs yeah. in and dies every time. <laughs> besides that, I think it's pretty much straightforward. You have this uh, Demacia core, you have your... Um, Standard carry in the form of Mordekaiser, which you're kind of looking to, well, complement slightly, and then you have the three cost reroll, the Panda comp basically, um, where you have two units on the same cost as an option, and then the Aatrox as your finishing touch, which remains the same. So, Kiana's basically that, with but better. Okay, cool, that's good. Uh, uh, then we just, I've got some other. Ones, but we're then we're going to try and back for it. So, a uh, vanquisher, or people's thoughts on vanquisher. Um, I think there uh, the TG interaction is interesting, um, because you can kind of use that as a filler um, item, especially if you have uh, more carries due to a spatula in it. Besides that, it's basically well, we it's very it's tied to Ionia. We had that before, and yeah, then we talked about Nyler as well. Um, I feel like Nilo outside of Bridgewater is not as reliant on RFC, but it's still insanely strong on her. Um, and then I think we covered the rest. Yeah, I guess just the... with the oh no, please bear. Just with the nature of the trait, it's just um, makes itemizing you know extra important. You just want it as much flat damage really as possible. Um, Zaya, for example, doesn't like Rageblade. Doesn't uh, you, you're not going to put any crit on her. Well, uh, I e even obviously you can run over like things like Last Whisper. But uh, yeah, I think just flat damage is the, mo the most important itemization for any Vanquisher variant. Okay, cool. Uh, I stuff has started to fall off a little bit for the other ones, but to uh, I guess just to go through the so we're nearly at the end. Uh, the the new items I've got them in the sheet here in the second tab. Yeah, uh, any see, thoughts on any of these ones? Um, in terms of for for even shroud or even shroud, um, it always felt odd to me that there was a that spark existed, but there was no front line uh, front line alternative mm. for uh, armor. So um, it feels like an item that. Just makes so much sense. It's it's nice to not have to build Last Whisper. Um, you have a another alternative, which I felt like AD often struggled with in yeah. the past. 
the so I, can, I can give you a TED talk on the items. <laughs> okay. So um yeah, the 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 spark is like um it, it kind of makes you not so reliant on both in your AD compositions because uh, that was previously one of the big issues in, in AD compositions uh, and you really really needing a bow just to get the last whisper and then get your normal AD carry items was also in, uh, usually included both so that was uh, kind of a hard thing um i think what's worth discuss uh, discussing is um is also because you you don't really have the utility items anymore to kind of like bail you out of um, components you don't want um that can lead you now to having leftover components which are really really awkward to use um, for example, if you have uh, excess bows uh, in a sorcerer composition, you can't just slam in a, a ZZ rod anymore. And you, let's say you don't have any swords for Gunblade specifically. Uh, I mean, for Giant Slayer specifically, you already have your magic penetration um, that, that can kind of make certain compositions um, feel very awkward to drop specific components. So people will now um, have to play around that a bit more consistency, uh, consistently. And we might see uh, things like, for example, Sorcerer pivots into uh, Asia compositions due to double bro drops. And that kind of works the other way around with, uh, for example, stuff like rods than AD compositions in certain situations. Uh, though rods now being like crown guard is a really good frontline item. Like usually you have lots of AP frontline units that can use it that gain additional shield and survivability, stuff like Taric, Shen, especially like all the Bastion units, basically. Um, so that makes cool. it really interesting. However, um, I think in general, it's worth discussing a bit between the um, moving of the utility items uh, to make it like uncraftable, because it kind of takes uh, some of the, um, well, more in-depth solutions you could do as a player out of the game and moves them into these uh, augment positions. Uh, I think that's worth discussing uh, because it can be a bit controversial. The question, though, is how in-depth do you want to go on broadcast with that? Because it might also be a discussion that Riot does not like because you can see the change very critically from that point of view, if you want to. Um, I, I think one thing that will be relevant on broadcasts and in the past has decided so many fights is you no longer will get to this point where there's two players alive in stage six and there's a Zephyr or a Shroud on the carousel and it ends up just completely determining the outcome of the game. So yeah. um, those bailout options um, or those moments where it's one player is wrong side and doesn't get the Zephyr and loses the game as a result, uh, those will no longer mm. happen, which I do like. I, do, I like that specifically, the fact that it doesn't just... You're the wrong side of the carousel. Unlucky. Yeah, that's um, the most positive change out of yeah, the item change, I would say. So I, I really like uh, the new items make the game feel a lot fresher. There's a lot more possibilities. Um, however, all these items are basically, as yes, they're all like either carry or um, tank focused. Um, it makes you, it gives you more options for your traditional units, and you even have units that are basically reprints, uh, but you can still think about new itemizations, so you kind of get more options there. Um, yeah, but then I have some use, uh, units, you'll still see the same builds, like, for example, the Titans BT Fiora, right? Mm. Yeah. I was going to say, I just share in the rejoicing of uh, Zephyr being moved to this support item uh, Cash just because again I have I have always been a anti Zephyr cheese person I guess I think it is a very uninteractive there's not a lot of interplay in the reaction especially just keep it on your bench and just try to go for there yes you can still do that but it being rarer to access helps alleviate a lot of those concerns so I feel pretty good the thing that I'm trying to still figure out, I think will still require a bit more time is that have we hit a point where when you're drop, say, three items at the start of the game, uh, three components, excuse me, at the start of the game, do we feel like most of the options that you could potentially build at 2-1 are still are now viable in ways that maybe with all the or items that just weren't in the past? Yeah, I definitely think, yeah. uh, for especially for players that maybe would like um, their approach is strongest board, players that really favor just win streaking or um, that type of approach, uh, yeah, I think this change, like you've said, is 
positive for certain play styles because you're not going to slam a Zephyr or Shroud, anything yeah. like that, at 2-1. But you can slam a lot of these now as maybe not ideal carry items, but they're good secondary choices. You're happy to have them. So um, I think for early for early game, it definitely changes the way some players will play. Well, I, I think you are basically streamlined how you approach items from the beginning of the game until the end of the game because... Um, what was true and what led to the support and utility items usually not being built until later in the game is that um, in the late game, like stage four and onwards, you really want to reach that point where you have three carry items and then hopefully one or two or three tank items as well, because that's just, if you don't have a fully stacked carry, you, the, the game just doesn't work. And that's just how it is. So um, now with all the items being options viable for that approach, um, it's but it's more streamlined. It's more easier to build your composition in that sense. But that also means you will also uh, see since you don't have the option to um, convert access uh, components into the support utility items, you will also see like multiple carry com uh, builds because it's easier to itemize two carries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I'll we'll also quickly mention just as a last quick note here that. Uh, Things like uh, Crown Guard, things like Nice Harvester, things like Nashers, or actually particularly Adaptive Helm, like not Nashers. Um, there's a lot more interesting options from AP frontline uh, units in TFT, like say Swain comes to mind, uh, Nico comes to mind, and I'm really curious to see how that is going to end up uh, shifting around as time goes on and players have more time to play around with this. Same thing with tools like Night Harvester, which is, you know, just bonus damage no matter which side of the ADA tree you find yourself on. Like, are you sure what uh, champions use uh, specific items? Because for me, I'm uh, like, uh, usually it would be nice to be able to talk about, I don't know, uh, Rageblade uh, being built. And then you have like a couple of compositions that come to mind. Um, here it's like for the new items, I'm not sure. Nash's Tooth, is it always Azir? Or is there uh, other it's options? Mordekaiser. Yeah, true. But you would Azir, still need Mordekaiser. an RC, really, right? Oh. Um, the the thing is though this is uh, very new and we uh, this will also shift depending on which champions are strong um, and I think we will need some time to develop all the on discover all the viable options and what is strong in which situation um, so we could theory craft about that right now but I was just hoping that you might know <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure, I mean, no, you can, no, you no. can always like I think for now it's worth to keep an eye on the stats for like users for um, the units and then if you're interested in that you can kind of observe how that develops over uh, over time especially over the patches um, but yeah for now I'm pretty sure this is definitely not solved yet even on the highest level okay I mean, I've kind of figured that will probably be where we'll be at, where this is always going to be a very early discussion rather than a definitive discussion. Uh, so we can absolutely come back to this a bit later on in the set and see. Uh, I was going to head out soon, so I'll actually I'll add something real quick. Um, one thing I've noticed with these new items that's kind of interesting is how synergistic they are with other items. So, like, normally you want to have three items something anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but, like, combining a Nasher's Tooth with a Spear of Shojin is like, oh, Spear of Shojin is that much better now. Or Steric's Gage, you combine that with a Bloodthirster on a frontline AD tank like Darius, mm -hmm. if it ever becomes good. Um, like these things are getting leaned into even more, and I think that's like kind of an interesting thing, um, where it's like, oh, you want to synergize Warmogs with uh, Redemption. Um, now you have another thing with that, where it's Nasher's Tooth plus a Spear of Shojin potentially, uh, and the other one where I mentioned where Steric's Gage wants to get combined with like a Bloodthirster potentially. Yep, that's a really good point. Okay. Uh, there is a little bit more stuff, but like I haven't really put any notes for it. So I guess we could be pretty good to wrap things up there, unless people have got anything else they want to get into at this point. I think the final item thing I just mentioned is um, the addition, the addition of adaptive helm. It feels like it's going to be one of those items for the majority of the set that a player is never going to commit too early. We're never going to see a player make it um, when early on in the game. It's just always going to be one of those options that's but you're perfectly fine making after stage five when your components come through and it's the one of your last options. So it feels like it's going to be one of those base safe makes, but people are 
not often going to be. It's a very. I think it will be a very strong tempo slam, but we'll have to wait and see because the, the so strength of the, yeah the strength of this is that it uh, it loses power and stats and trades that for flexibility. Um, so let's say in the early game, um, you kind of want a frontline item, um, so you slam it. And then you, you you play around it. You have like a really strong tank that's good. And then you drop more frontline items later. You can you can just pivot it onto a backline yeah, unit, um, and you can do it like the other way around if you need like a mana item. Um, I know people like to slam the helm and AP comes right now. Play it in the backline in in, in the early game on their Malzaha, and then just transition it to a frontline item uh, later in the game as an example. And mm. that uh, can be quite powerful. Um, if you go for a tempo playstyle, anyways, but we'll have to wait and see. I think it's a bit of an of an awkward item, but uh, yeah, in in theory, it's uh, quite yeah. interesting. It has more. It's, there's depth to it, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Suppose it a tournament setting because it's never a best in. It'll never be a best in slot item. No. Um, <laughs> it depends heavily on the game, the tournament state. A player may have the option to make it if they only need a fourth, for example. That's what, um, then they just play a tempo, like you said. But if somebody needs a high placement, they're never going to commit to it. They won't want to greed their items. So I think it'll probably be more relevant in tournament settings, depending on what state of the tournament a certain player is in and what placement they need. So. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I, I would be careful with this, calling this a good for getting a fourth, because uh, following a tempo slam um, and transitioning it into it like a like a frontline item, for example, um, it can be good, very good play if you're looking for top one, top two, depending on your win conditions. Yeah, um, I, I just meant so, more so if people yeah. would just read because, the best in slot. Yeah, just because people it first, wrote it yeah. down. It's uh, with more focus on what are you slamming it for? Are you looking for tempo? Are you looking to kill components? Uh, stuff like that. That's what I would look out for with this item. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it sounds like it's a good time to wrap up since we're at least short of being too far over the promised time. Uh, but yeah, I'll stick this up on YouTube uh, so people can join it and uh, can check back in afterwards. And yeah, I guess maybe towards more towards the end of the of the set, which I guess isn't that far away, we can come back to this and get into a bit more detail now that we've covered the basic grants. Uh, anyone got any last things you want to get in before we close up today? We should talk about the shred, I feel like, but we can also move that to another time. Uh, we could perhaps spend a couple of minutes talking about it if, if you guys want to. Uh, did you see the post I linked regarding the shred? So... Yes, no, that kind of likes it. That, that are fun uh, stats I think you can throw in, actually, on the broadcast. Um, yeah, I'll, put in, I'll general... put in resources as well. I feel like this is yeah. going to be relevant for yeah. Yes. Time. And then uh... just um, to keep it to be, keep it short, I would say just focus on Shred not being mandatory anymore, 100%. It's still strong. You you want it most of the time. But there will be times when you can't really um, afford to buy it or to build it, uh, and then that will be fine. Um, so yeah, it pivots away from it, and it kind of emphasizes different builds as well. Um, because like a lot, obviously, higher defense builds become a bit more viable thanks uh, to that because they just don't get shredded away. Uh, so we have to wait and see. It will shape the matter slightly, I believe, but with Bastions right now being nerfed preemptively, being very weak, uh, we'll have to see once they are buffed. But yeah, might be some uh, balancing um, issues with that later down the road. I think, um, just quickly, I'll, to carry on what you were saying before with the support items being gone, meaning you can itemize more carries in a similar way with Sunder and Shred being weaker. Uh, you can also, it gives you more components to lean towards itemizing another carry. So I think both... Tank. Uh, yeah, uh, or a tank, yeah. <laughs> or either or. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think both the Sunder and Shred changes and the support changes all lead into dual carry compositions being, or dual frontline compositions being like with massive tanks be more viable because so you don't need to use them on utility options as much as last set. Cool. Yeah. 
maybe a good point to highlight that would be when you actually do see a player that uh, did not build any shred and then they do well anyways. But that would be really rare to see uh, last in the previous sets, I would think. So that may be a good highlight uh, time to highlight these changes during a cast. Okay, cool. Says. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so I'll wrap. Well, let's wrap that one up there. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, this will be available in the uh, recorded practices channel. Uh, but yeah.